All right. How are we doing? Let's see if people can join. Give a few minutes before I do the actual intro here. Well, I can't tell if anyone's on. Oh, good. All right, so I guess I got people. I guess Andrew's here. Woo! All right, I won't be able to see exactly who's here, but we can get started. Um, hi, guys. <laughs> At least I've got some of my family here. Woo! Awesome. All right. What's up, guys? So uh, we'll see if people trickle in, if I get comments, stuff like that. Um, I hope people are able to see this and it's going right. So uh, I am going to do a little bit of an intro here uh, for myself and for um, disclosure reasons. <clears throat> and um, as you guys have questions, feel free to drop them in. I'm going to be checking in there. Um, this will be general information. There's stuff, some stuff you may know, some stuff you might not. Um, I'm going to kind of talk about some basic superficial things and then get a little deeper into the science if people are curious and interested in how it works. What's going on with coronavirus? What makes it special? I'm going to be talking about that. So welcome. So I hope everybody's doing well. Uh, I know it's been a tough time. Everybody's kind of been feeling the pressure with the quarantine that's going around. around. Everyone's been uh, a little bit panicky, which I think hopefully we can try to um, reassure and try to get rid of some of that anxiety. Talk about what we can do and uh, what we shouldn't do when it comes to this. Um, the thing to remember is uh, be careful and stay calm and be smart. That's, you know, the best advice I can give anybody, right? Um, so for those of you, if anybody's logging in and they don't know me as you see this, uh, my name is Dr. Mark Wiseman. So I am a practicing emergency medicine physician. I was trained um, out of Philadelphia. Um, I currently work as a traveling physician. I work in both Missouri, California, and actually a little bit in Arizona. So I have been practicing, seeing a bit of this. Um, uh, for those of you who do know me, family and friends, uh, hi, welcome. I'm glad to see you guys. I hope everyone's staying safe. I love you. Thanks for being here. All right. Um, so I do have to do some disclaimers for legal reasons. Uh, first and foremost, anything I say is uh, speaking on behalf of myself. I don't represent or speak for any kind of organization or hospital. This is just me talking to you as a person and my emergency medicine background. Um, second thing is you can't take anything that I say as strict medical advice for yourself. Uh, use it as information, make your own decisions, uh, make your best decisions. Hope everybody's uh, case and situation is unique. So make the best decision uh, that you can for yourself. And like I said, I am wearing my Drexel alma mater uh, shirt right now. Um, but I can't speak for them, uh, and this isn't speaking for any organization. I just figured I represent my Hahnemann homies. If you're out there watching this, uh, heads up to you guys. All right. Please know. So I am an emergency medicine physician. Um, <laughs> Brianne says I look different. I know. I shaved. Everyone's going to be freaking out. It's fine. Anyway, so I'm an emergency medicine physician, so I focus on um, specific emergencies and critical re uh, resuscitation. I do everything from heart attacks, strokes, urinary tract infections, sore throats, all the stuff. Anything that comes into the emergency department is my responsibility to treat and um, improve and get you better. Um, with this new coronavirus, it definitely has um, created a large obstacle and a new challenge for us uh, in the emergency medicine field as well as all healthcare practitioners from EMS all the way up to top in the ICU. So everything that we're doing, um, and as information comes, it's changing daily. So we're gonna be trying to do new updates. I'm gonna give you the best information I can right now, um, but it can change, right? So keep your eyes out. Actually, my friend Kevin and I were working on trying to do uh, almost a daily update. We're talking about doing another video tomorrow, um, talking about some of the new updates and things that have changed. So if you're still curious, if I piqued your interest, heck, you know, look back, uh, we're going to be back at it tomorrow. 
Um, the thing to remember is that I am an emergency medicine physician. I'm not a surgeon. I'm not a gynecologist. I'm definitely not an epidemiologist, virologist. There are specialists out there who uh, can give you more particular information in their field. So I'm going to be speaking as an emergency medicine physician. I can only speak to my own practice and my own experience. So I hope that helps. But uh, I, of course, I'm only human. Uh, I don't know everything. Uh, my mom will probably tell you otherwise, but don't listen to her. I mean, you should listen to her. She's great. But um, she, I don't know everything. So uh, as always, take everything I say with a grain of salt. Um, all right. So, oh, also keep in mind, if you are tuning in here, I'll say this again. So after I'm done with this, I'm going to save this post. I'm going to put it up and I'm going to put a bunch of links and infographics that I've found throughout the week or so. Well, it's been two weeks or so now um, that I've been researching and looking into this. Um, I'm going to put it on the link below. There's a lot of interesting information, whether it be for uh, practicing physician or healthcare providers or for the lay person. Both should get be able to get some good information from the links and stuff I uh, put at the bottom of this. So uh, feel free to peruse that at your leisure. All right, um, there's been a few questions submitted. Um, I'm going to go through some of the basic and most common ones. Um, there's a bunch of common ones. People have hit me up with the same questions multiple times. So um, if you have specific questions, please comment them. I will go through them. I'm going to have a list of basic ones. Uh, which I get to kind of go through and nerd out a little bit because I like this stuff. Um, and um, we're going to cover that, and then I'm going to get to specific questions, some of the uh, other uh, little things that people had. So, ready, here we go. Hope everyone's paying attention. Welcome. If I'm speaking too fast, let me know. I have a tendency to get that. I'm a little nervous because this is my first time really being online. So, uh, all right, let's get at it. So, so first big question, and I'm going to kind of break this down, is what is the coronavirus and what makes it special, right? Everyone's talking about this new or novel coronavirus. So what novel, novel strictly means, it simply means is new. And the fact that we haven't seen this particular strain of coronavirus before. Now, people might have heard that the coronavirus does cause the common cold, which is true, right? So this virus is not something that's totally unknown to us as practitioners into the uh, virology and epidemiology fields. Um, there are a number of strains of it for which do cause the common cold. Um, this strain in particular happens to be somewhat related to the SARS virus that we saw in the past. Um, it's, uh, it's a different strain from it. It has a different um, set of binding enzymes which we'll kind of talk to, talk about. Um, the term corona, from my understanding, comes from the ring of proteins, which it uses to enter the host cell, right? Every virus works by a lock and key mechanism. Um, this particular virus has a, a crown or a circle of proteins, which it uses to lock onto the um, designated cell and then enter it, which what's, this is what viruses do. This is how they, um, uh, this is how they uh, enter the cell, cause damage, and then get you sick, right? Um, We'll talk about more about what they target, things like that. The thing to know is that this virus does tend to target uh, specific cells. I'm going to go more into the actual biochemistry of that because I find it interesting. You guys have to deal with it. Um, but essentially goes into the cells uh, mostly in the bottom of your lungs, which is why it's causing such an issue. Um, so one of my favorite questions, and I'm seeing a lot of stuff on this, is where did it come from and how did we get it? And of course, I think China's taking over the world. It's a conspiracy theory. They're going to shut us all down. Oh my God, but not really, right? So uh, um, a couple of theories here. So it is a known zoonotic infection or zoonotic crossover. So this is something that's also uh, not, not necessarily unexpected, right? So what we think right now, what the theory is, is <clears throat> that this um, transferred over either from bats or pangolins. So um, when you ever have a virus that exists out in the wild or it's infecting animals, it's gonna go through a series of mutations. Once that uh, infection, once that, um, I'm sorry, that virus or pathogen can uh, mutate enough that it can affect humans, it ends up being new. It's something the immune system hasn't seen before. And then it can jump the species barrier and now infect a new species. That's something we know. One of the most common and famous examples that you can probably think of is something called the might have heard of it. I don't know. But that's an example of something that has, has been able to cross species 
and cause a massive uh, epidemic, right? That's how these epidemics essentially occur. Is it something that used to infect a certain species of animal that now has crossed over into humans and our immune system just isn't quite prepared for this kind of new pathogen or virus and therefore it spreads and causes all sorts of mayhem. So that's where we're at. Um, the current theory is that it originally could have come from bats. I've heard an interesting theory that maybe it came from pangolins. There's a black market trade of these cute furry little animals uh, that a lot of people have and they're also mammals that are somewhat related and people think it might have crossed species by people uh, illegally importing these. So another um, plug to stop the illegal trade of uh, these endangered animals. All right, moving on. So why, what's the problem with coronavirus and why is it uh, causing so many problems here? Well, uh, the problem is twofold, right? So the to put it simply, the problem with coronavirus, ah, problem with coronavirus is that it's pretty much silent. It's silent in a lot of people. And the fact that it isn't that deadly. And what am I talking about? Everybody's freaking out about the death rate on this. And you have to take it seriously. Coronavirus is pretty deadly and it does have a pretty significant death rate. But when you look at a virus and you look at a pathogen, virus by itself doesn't want to kill its host, right? The goal of a virus is to reproduce itself. It worms its way into your cells. It hijacks your cellular machinery to allow it to reproduce and um, then re and then propagate and go, right? So in an ideal world, the virus would be able to infect the host, spread its genes, and then keep doing that forever, okay? Um, what we look at when we look at viruses and pathogens is we kind of look at the death rate uh, versus the infectivity, right? So I'm kind of doing this backwards because I'm mirrored, but your x-axis um, would be your infectivity and your y-axis is your death rate. Something that's actually the worst would be, if I'm doing this right, um, would be something that's somewhere in the middle that kind of goes right along that line, right? Because what happens is in a, in a case like SARS, so we took SARS as a good example. It's our best uh, historical example for uh, a pathogen or a virus like this that's caused such a big pandemic. The thing with SARS is that SARS was really deadly and you usually didn't, you weren't able to transmit the virus or the, the disease until you were symptomatic, right? So the nice thing about SARS, nice thing, okay, was that with SARS, if you got it, you got really sick really quickly and you weren't shedding the virus or giving it to other people until you were very sick. So that means um, only the, the people that were sick, we were able to identify who was sick, treat them, get them isolated, get them quarantined and deal with it. The problem with coronavirus is how silent it is, right? So I've seen um, articles out there that speak to it being uh, silent in up to 89% of cases. There are, um, there's research, there's things done out of China that shows 89% of people can be totally asymptomatic and you're still shedding that virus, right? Crazy. So. Um, that's why we're talking about this. That's why we're taking it so seriously, because it's really hard to know who has it. And it's really hard to know um, if you have it and what to do about it. So I see, Aaron, I see your question about uh, predictions for healthcare system. I do want to talk about that. So um, we're going to talk about why we need to um, deal with this and why it's so important, flattening the curve and what that actually means. I think it's important to sort of clarify that. Um, and yeah, we'll get to that. So. All right, going through my stuff, see what we have. So, all right, big thing. What are the most common symptoms? Everyone's like, how do I know if I have it? And the, the big answer is you don't. Sorry, bro, you don't know. Um, there's no way to really tell. So, like I said, up to 90% of cases, I think 86% in one of the studies, people can be totally asymptomatic, right? So that's the hard thing about it because we're really struggling to try and figure out who has not who doesn't. So that's not really helpful to you. So let me see if I can help. So um, for most people that have tested positive, we'll talk about the symptoms that they have. And keep in mind the people that are generally testing positive, now this differs country to country, but they're generally the people that are pretty darn sick, right? That have been so sick that they're coming to the hospital. So um, of those people, where was my thing? So, um, the most common symptom of the people that are coming in is cough. Up to 80% of people uh, that have it, that are come to the hospital have a cough, right? Um, that tends to vary a little bit. Um, 
uh, and the severity of it, because that usually doesn't start until about day five or six, but cough is the most common thing. Um, following that, the next most common thing is a fever. Um, at, this is a little bit less. So only 40% of people at the time of presentation to the hospital or testing positive actually had a fever, right? So um, the good thing about that is as people progress, so if you came to the hospital, you had it, 40% had a fever, but by the end of it, about 85%. So it is kind of helpful um, by the end of the course uh, of the uh, course of the disease, most people will have a fever and most people will have a cough. Now you get to some of the more vague symptoms. Cold-like symptoms, you know, runny nose, that sore throat, that's in more like 20 to 40% of people. Um, that's the same amount in people that feel short of breath. Uh, from my experience in the ER in cases I've heard, um, I've, I would say that that's probably accurate. I think about five to 10% of people that I've talked about, Aaron, I'm gonna get to that question. Five to 10% of people I've heard of and dealt with um, have had a sensation of shortness of breath. It's actually pretty common, kind of a feeling here like it's hard to take a deep breath or you're breathing through a straw. That's a pretty significant symptom. That's when people have been reporting. Um, there are other people, uh, about 10% will get GI symptoms, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, things of that nature. So it's something to pay attention to. Um, obviously, we're dealing with the fact that it's so hard to tell um, because so many people can have any of these symptoms or none of these symptoms, bam, it's like, it's the struggle. That's why we're, we're kind of freaking out about it. Not to panic anybody, but that's why we're taking the measures that we are. So um, uh, I would say in the most part, one of these symptoms usually doesn't constitute a full-blown coronavirus. I would say if you get to two or three, I would think about it. If you are having one, I'm telling everybody, if you think you could have it, you stay home, and don't get everybody else sick, okay? Um, also, my numbers people out there, if you're curious, so we're talking about how long till symptoms and what stuff like that, how long do you feel? So um, they actually looked at, so the median time to uh, symptoms from onset to from infection to symptoms is actually 5.1 days, right? So the average is five days. That means most people are walking around out there uh, for five days, have the disease, are giving it to other people, and have no idea that they have it, right? So that's the people that show up. Another statistic I saw was up to 80% um, of people will come in, 80% um, uh, of people will take up to eight days before they have symptoms, right? Um, they do say that 97% of people who are going to get symptoms will have them by day 12, right? So if you're gonna get it by 12, day 12, you'll know, right? So. Yeah, Chris asked a good question. How do you differentiate between coronavirus, allergies, or common cold? So, um, uh, where was I? I was saying um, uh, those symptoms and uh, 12 days, you should know that you have it. So I'm gonna take a quick, I wanna answer some of these quick questions um, and then I'm gonna get to these. So quick one, Erin asked, cause I don't wanna forget about her. What are the projections for the healthcare system and when it exceeds capacity? Um, I'm gonna link a um, infographic. So some of the initial projections for this are actually a little bit concerning. So my friend who's a MPH in public health, now he is not, he would not claim himself, I don't want to put him on the spot, uh, he would not call himself an epidemiologist, he just says he does it for fun. Um, so he did an initial projection, and again I will link this at the bottom, but his thing said without any intervention we could have expected our healthcare system uh, to be essentially overburdened in June and July, and then completely overwhelmed and shut down in August, right? So that's a kind of a pessimistic viewpoint, but man, um, that's pretty realistic, right? The way that this spreads is we could legitimately and seriously be looking at this for many months, and it doesn't take long for the healthcare system to, to go under. Now, why does that happen? Here in America, we only have a certain uh, number of hospital beds and a certain number of resources, right? So I think they said on average, we have about 2.5 ICU beds per capita per person or per thousand people so per capita in the United States, which is much lower than in other countries. So what that means is if everybody gets sick at the same time, we're gonna overwhelm, there's just not gonna be enough beds. There's not gonna be enough resources. And that's what we're already seeing on the front lines. We're already seeing that in hospitals. That's what's happening is we're running out of masks and gowns and we're running out of ventilators. 
So the problem with that is that if these people, these elderly people who are primarily targeted, um, if they're the ones getting sick and using the ventilator, that means if you have a heart attack, if you have a stroke, if you get in a car accident and you need that ventilator, you need those supplies, they're just not there, right? Now, I'm looking at stuff. I've been looking into some of the data and the articles. We're hoping that um, some of our companies and some of the big manufacturers are going to redistribute uh, the way that they manufacture to try and focus those things on the things that we need. Plastic for ventilators, uh, cloth and the, the plastics that we use for masks, some of the simple things, even trying to get those tests out there, right? We need the swabs to try and test people and try to manufacture those tests to try and get those going, right? Those are things that we need and we need to start a focus on in order to not overwhelm our medical system. Um, I'm going to talk about, Amy, I see your question about the malaria drug. I'm definitely going to touch on that. Um, surviving on plastic, I'm almost there. So um, that actually answers that question. So, and then we talked about, and I did talk a little bit about flattening the curve. Um, the big thing with this, and that's why we talk about how long is it going to last? And I you know, mentioned why it's so important for us to be doing what we're doing. So one of the big things I want to get out there and say is that Current projections say that they think no matter what we do, regardless, summertime, anything like that, 60 to 70% of the population is going to get this, right? No matter what. The problem is over what time frame? If everyone gets sick at the same time, right, then we don't have the resources, we don't have the beds, we don't have the people, we don't have the me, the doctors out there enough to deal with it and then people die. And that's what's happening in Italy, right? So Italy doesn't have enough resources and they have to make triage decisions on who dies and who doesn't. If you're over 80, sometimes they're telling people that, I'm sorry, there's nothing to do. And that's the situation we're trying to avoid, right? Hear me, try to imagine looking at somebody and saying, I'm sorry, I have to make the decision between this 40 year old and this 80 year old, I'm sorry, but they're gonna have to die. So it's a scary situation and one that we, um, very seriously could be dealing with. So that's why it's so important. So the reason we're quarantining, the reason we're doing stuff is not necessarily to try and um, spare you and I. We're probably gonna get it at some point. Um, and I have to say, you know, I looked at some of the, the statistics. You know, if you've been sick with a virus, the truth is you can actually shed the virus and give it to other people, especially those who are really sick, up to 37 days, a month, right? So we're not necessarily looking at quarantine and then it's over. People here have to realize this is gonna last a long time. The reason we're doing this is to try and slow that down. You're trying to prevent overwhelming our healthcare system so that way, you know, um, we don't get overburdened and run out of resources. And, you know, my plug for this is gonna be, um, there's people out there who are not taking this seriously, right? You hear about um, people down in Florida, and frankly, there I heard about an ER doctor who's had a house party down there, which I think is disgraceful. Um, I think, you know, people don't take it seriously, but the point is if we are, if the healthcare system is out of resources and run down, when you get shot, if you get into a car accident, you know, if your asthma acts up, we won't be able to take care of you. It just won't happen. And then we'll be back, you know, it'll be like practicing a hundred years ago where we're just kind of like, you know, here's a little bit of something. Good luck. We hope you don't die. So for those of you who are like, this isn't a big deal. Yeah. I mean, for most of us, 99% um, of us, we're going to be okay, uh, and we're not going to die from the coronavirus. You know, um, there's, you're more likely to die from a car accident this year than die from coronavirus. But what you're doing is you're saving the medical system and the healthcare system. So, <laughs> thanks, Kyle. Um, all right. So, where are we? Um, what are the questions I want to do with? Okay. So a lot of people, things that people are talking about uh, is treatment. So uh, Amy brought up um, rumors about the malaria drug. Is it a practical answer and readily available? So I'm going to intervene. So um, this, I'll go into some of the, the discussion about treatment. So um, treatment out there right now is the data is pretty, pretty terrible, uh, pretty minimal, I'll say. Um, so the two uh, things that I heard most talk about is the anti-malarial drug called chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine. Um, so this is a drug that's used to basically, um, it affects the way that the body responds to malaria, um, in layman's term, and um, decreases that response. So 
Um, right now, they are finding that chloroquine has been effective in treating certain people that are getting the overwhelming form of the disease in late disease. That, that means critically ill people or those on a ventilator, right? So what that also means is it's not really going to help you or I, right? So as far as general treatment, it doesn't really help. So what it does, and this is uh, this is going to launch into, so um, something to understand about the virus and, and what it does is, and I'm going to talk to, so those of you who are interested in nerds like me, um, we're going to talk about um, why it affects certain people and um, why certain people are at higher risk. It's kind of an interesting biochemical question. Um, but essentially, the problem with this virus is, as I mentioned previously, it's new to our immune system. So when our body sees it, what happens is it kind of overreacts. Some people might have heard of something called a cytokine storm. It's one way to think about it. So essentially, instead of reacting normally and treating the virus, basically attacking it, blowing it up, and basically containing that disease, what happens is it overreacts. And when the body overreacts, it kind of goes on a scorched earth kind of approach. You call it napalming the whole area. And that leads to basically inflammation, swelling, and fibrosis, which is scar tissue in the lungs, right? We know about this disease process. It's something called acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS, and it affects the people in a lot of different um, respiratory illnesses. So they think that using chloroquine basically decreases that uh, hyperreactive response by the immune system so that your body and your, the rest of the symptoms can kind of uh, react, get rid of the virus, and you can recover, right? So it's that damage to the lungs that happens from your own body's scorched earth response that causes that problem chloroquine uh, seems to help. Now, obviously, so that means if you're not having that degree of response, if your body hasn't reacted that way, it's probably not going to help you. At this point, there's no data to suggest that it's actually going to make a difference uh, in, a, in individual people or that it's going to be preventative. In fact, I have one of my rheumatologist friends who posted uh, yesterday saying, please, for the love of God, stop buying it because he doesn't have enough for his regular patients and Crohn's patients and other uh, uh, rheumatologic patients that need it and they're running out of it. So be careful. If you're concerned about it, talk to your doctor, give them a call. But right now there's not a lot of information. I did today read an article that talked about another um, antiviral medication, which is currently undergoing clinical trials. Um, optimistic, maybe antivirals are, have been spotty in the past at best. Um, we have Tamiflu, uh, which has been an anti, uh, antiviral for um, uh, the flu. Uh, honestly, as practitioners here, we've seen uh, mixed reactions to it. Some people benefit from it, some people don't. There are certain populations that certainly do, but as far as talking about general people, there's no real guarantee um, that it's going to make a difference. So unfortunately, that's not a great one. Um, Kyle, I'm intervening. Yes, if you go to Bare Facts right now, I'm pretty sure there's about a 99% chance you won't and you'll be uh, completely immune to coronavirus, so you should see how that goes. Test it out and get back to me. Um, I do want to say, uh, going back to, um, uh, there is, has been talk, they've tried to use the antiretrovirals, which are used for HIV, and long story short, they don't help. For those of us in healthcare, and it kind of makes sense. It's a totally different mechanism that this virus uses to invade and cause problems. So there's no real reason to think that it was going to make much difference, fortunately. So, all right. Let's see where we're at. Okay. How Aaron did ask, um, how long does it survive in plastic? So um, there's actually a really nice article from the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, which I looked at the virus and it looked on different surfaces. So it looked at aerosols, so how long it lasts in the air. And then um, it looked at uh, stainless steel, plastic, copper, and cardboard, right? So it found that um, there were uh, viral particles there were viral particles in the air uh, for up to three hours. So that means, so um, they did find uh, significant titers in the air for up to three hours. So um, what that means is, and somebody asked pretty point blank, does that mean if somebody sneezed and I walk by two hours and uh, get it, can I get the disease? The short answer is yes, that's why that's there. There's a lot of other factors that go into um, how you actually contract the disease. Your body has um, 
sort of walls like preventative immune uh, mechanisms to try and prevent you from getting every virus that you're exposed to or walk into. But that's kind of the scary part about this disease. Somebody can basically be asymptomatic, not have any problems, cough into the air and spread it to anybody that walks by in the next few hours. Now, they looked at different surfaces. So we looked at stainless steel, plastic, and uh, copper, and cardboard. Um, basically, cardboard didn't see anything significant. Um, stainless steel lasted, they saw um, viral titers up to 48 hours. Plastic, they saw up to 72 hours in viable, right? So that's why we're talking up to uh, four days that this can exist on different plastics and can be there and can still be communicable. Now, what do you talk about with communicable? If that's actually something you can get, it's hard to say exactly, precisely. Um, when when you talk about infection, there has to be a certain number of viruses on a particular sub a substance and in you for you to actually get infected. Like I said, your um, body has systems in place to prevent just a couple of viruses getting in and causing a significant uh, process. That's why, I mean, uh, the mucus in your nose, in your saliva, in your mouth, it has a lot of enzymes, antibodies, and things that are there to try and prevent you from getting uh, any kind of virus that comes by, right? So there are things in place. All right, so let's look at some questions. Um, I'll go through uh, Advil ibuprofen. All right, actually, so Chris asks, um, is it true that Advil or ibuprofen can make it worse? And yes, why? So I'm going to use this question. Um, uh, Igor's making fun of me. It's good. It's what he's good for. He's like the ultimate troll. So everybody should, should harass him. All right. So um, this talks about what, I want to kind of use this as a segue and talk about um, who does it infect, why does it infect, and what makes it work. So for me, I'm a little bit of a biochemistry nerd. I like this stuff. So I get a little bit excited about uh, talking about this. So um, they've actually found uh, some interesting things about coronavirus. So um, well, what they found is that um, uh, and there's a study for 40, 000, uh, 45,000 people and found that men were affected more than women and found that people with hypertension and certain comorbidities were affected and had more severe disease. So uh, here it is. I'm going to look it up. So uh, fatality rate is higher. So while the, while the fatality rate was 1% of people were otherwise healthy, 10.5% of people with cardiovascular disease, 7.5% for people with diabetes, 6% with people with chronic respiratory disease, which is like asthma or COPD, and an overall 2.3% mortality rate. So something interesting that they found and that they're looking at is something called the ACE2 receptor or the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor. So what this is, this is a receptor which is involved in the complex feedback mechanism, which regulates your blood pressure, essentially. It helps regulate some other things, it's essentially runs your sympathetic nervous system, kind of that mild fight or flight system, kind of how amped up you are on a general basis. So the ACE2 receptor is present on the vascular cells in your heart. It's present on the type two, those cells in the bottom of your lung. It exists also on the kidneys and the liver. Now they found with the coronavirus, now this is similar to the SARS virus, is that it needs that receptor in order to enter the cell. So basically, remember that lock and key mechanism I was talking about earlier? This virus essentially looks at that receptor, uses it as the lock and key, and then enters the cell through that receptor. It needs that receptor to enter. That's why it's affecting the lungs and the heart, causes those cardiac diseases. So this kind of is one of the reasons we think that explains why people with uh, high blood pressure or cardiovascular disease are at higher risk for more severe disease. Okay, so this is also a conversation they're looking at. So a lot of people will be on ACE inhibitors or ARBs. So those are antihypertensive or, low, or blood pressure lowering medications, which actually you work on that system to try and decrease the amount of essentially ACE, the angiotensin in your system. Unfortunately, that upregulates your uh, ACE inhibitor receptors, or I'm sorry, your, yeah, your ACE inhibitor receptors. Yeah, ACE2 receptors, excuse me, or ACE2 receptors. So there's been some speculation to the uh, correlation between how much ACE2 receptor you have and how severe your, uh, the disease is, as we've talked about. Um, 
That being said, don't run off and suddenly stop your ACE inhibitors. They think that suddenly stopping that has much more significant consequences than simply um, staying on it and doing the other preventative measures. But that's what they're thinking is happening with Advil, um, ibuprofen, Motrin, all of those medications. So those are good antipyretics. We do tend to recommend those in uh, people that have influenza or other um, febrile diseases. In this particular case, honestly, the actual data is a little bit unclear. It's not super specific. Uh, they're still working on those um, the research to actually look what the correlation is. Right now, because of that um, theoretical relationship, we are recommending people not use ibuprofen and try to avoid it because there might be a relationship to the more severity of the disease. Truthfully, it hasn't been looked at closely. It's essentially, I think it was one French uh, physician who looked at it and saw the correlation and came up with the theoretical um, connection between the two. So unsure, totally right yet. Um, right now we're recommending people use Tylenol instead and try and stay away from it, but that's uh, the current thought process behind it. And also um, why people feel uh, men and people with hypertension are at increased risk. Another thing I get to put in as a little segue, Right now, they do have a little bit of evidence that um, estrogen is protective. Now, this comes from studies from uh, the SARS virus on mice. They found that mice that were female and still had their ovaries were less likely to have more severe disease. Why that is, we don't know. But congratulations to you women out there. Maybe now we'll finally see some equality because you are less affected from this disease than young men are. Now, that certainly doesn't mean you can't be. Everybody has their own risk factors. Everything's going on. but that's the current data out there. So Amy, please, I want all the questions, get everything out right now. Nobody apologize for asking questions unless your name's Igor Schusterman, because then you need to apologize for just existing. And I see you out there. Um, so Andrew asked a good question. Will homemade masks reduce exposure? Unfortunately, the data out there sort of points to no. Um, anything you can do to kind of reduce it, reduce it is less. For those of you who are nerds like me, um, let me find the data. It's They say that the, the current virus is 0 0.3 to 0 0.7 microns diameter, which means that for most of the mass and the surgical mass we have out there, it's not very effective. Uh, the minimal mass that we are recommending are the type three surgical masks, which you can find um, uh, in most of the outlets we have them in, in, the store, in the hospitals, excuse me. But that's why they're recommending the N95 masks. The N95 masks are the only ones that have a tight enough seal to actually prevent significant exposure. So unfortunately, the answer is they don't really seem to be helpful. Um, I know my mom's been talking about trying to come up with um, fabric surgical masks and uh, hand-sewn ones. By the way, a plug for my mother. She's a wonderful woman. I hope she's watching, I can't tell. Um, but she is trying to help out. That's probably generally not for the general public. That's probably for those physicians and uh, surgeons who need those masks for general protection for other things. Um, there are a couple links out there. I think it's a good idea to try and help and for, for the general public. Is it really gonna help with the coronavirus? Unfortunately, the data right now actually points to no, that's not very helpful. So, all right, I'm looking through, seeing what other questions you guys have. Do you think coronavirus will be around as long as Hahnemann? Um, the answer is Hahnemann's closed, thanks for that. Um, how long are you sick for? So Dariana asks, and I'm sorry if you missed this, um, do specific things happen at certain points? So yes, I did uh, touch on this earlier. Uh, I apologize if I'm repeating myself, but uh, right now the average um, length of illness, also I said um, the average length to symptoms is about five days. Most people have symptoms by 11, uh, 11 to 12 days. Uh, do specific things happen in certain points. So they do say that most people will have, so the other day I had, most people will be essentially asymptomatic until day five or six, six excuse me. At that point, you can expect a cough or a low-grade fever. Some people get a prodrome of a little bit of uh, runny nose and sore throat. Usually by day eight to 10 is when you're getting more of that sensation of uh, shortness of breath, of feeling more severely ill. Then for most people, if you are like a normal person, healthy like you or me, um, then you're kind of done, right? So usually 
after about five or six days of being sick, you're going to run your course, you're going to feel better, and you're going to be done with it, right? I've even had, um, even anecdotally, I've had some uh, patients or some people I've known who felt super ill, gotten sick for about five days, and then kicked it, feel better. If we're talking about the more severe uh, form of the illness, that's a much harder thing to answer. That can last for up to, well, I don't, I don't even want to speculate. When you get acute respiratory distress syndrome, we're talking on the order of weeks to months. What happens in that scenario, as we said, is your lungs end up filling up with fluid and scar tissue. So once you, one, you have to decrease that inflammation, which can take days to weeks. And then when you have scar tissue, in order for your lungs to work properly again, you have to remodel that scar tissue and turn it back into normal tissue, which can take a long time. I've had cases totally unrelated to coronavirus that I've dealt with in the ICU, which have taken, I think I had a lady that was there for a month and a half before she started to get better. So that's not unrealistic. And that's why we're so concerned about overwhelming the resources in the hospital, because if grandma's in the hospital with ARDS and severe disease, she could be there for months trying to get better. And then other people that need her ventilators, those things come in. Now we're faced with a significant conundrum. Um, let's see what we got here. Um, Jackie uh, asked, Jackie Meadow asks, um, have you heard of confirmed COVID patients with GI symptoms too? Yes, that is actually something. That only happens in 10% of the, the cases, but that can be something you can see, which includes uh, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Um, all right, so I'm going to go into some of the other, we're going to get back into this. So I had somebody before ask me about, um, does coronavirus cause long-term fibrosis in survivors of the disease? So this is something that goes back into the more severe form of the, the disease. For you and me, I would say, and for most people, don't be concerned about that. For the vast majority of us, the data out there kind of suggests that if you uh, kick the, the virus, if you kick the disease, you should expect to not really have much more, uh, any long-term problems. Now, anytime you develop any kind of scar tissue or injury to your lungs, that causes that fibrosis, which again, for people that are new, that's the laying down of scar tissue in the lower portions of your lungs and the lung cells. Um, that typically is seen with people that develop acute respiratory distress syndrome or injury to that area. Um, but um, so essentially, if you're not in the ICU and you're not having significant problems, I would not expect any significant long-term problems or long-term scarring. Um, from my list, I have um, what can be best done to support medical staff? I mean, obviously, I love this question. I love hear, hearing people uh, who care and are thinking about us. Um, obviously, so one of the big things is um, stop hoarding the masks and start helping us out with the personal protective equipment. Um, so far, there's at least two physicians in the United States who are critically ill from coronavirus. We've been doing our best and the people out there have been doing our best to try and protect ourselves. But it's getting to the point where the CDC has now recommended that we use cloths and handkerchiefs or uh, scarves to try and protect ourselves, which in my opinion, essentially brings us back to the Middle Ages. We might as well be in a third world country with nothing, right? So I think that that's, that's terrible. Um, you know, I, as we said, I think there's some funny things out there. I would say if you know somebody who's hoarding these masks, uh, maybe go knock down their door. I certainly do not endorse anything completely critical or uh, uh, criminal. Uh, but if something happens, I might not be too upset about it. Um, the other thing is um, be mindful about coming to the hospital, right? So I'm an emergency medicine physician. I'm here to treat heart attacks, strokes, um, anything that might be ailing you. If you really need to come to the emergency department, I want to see you there. The problem is the way our country has developed, a lot of people have been forced to or just use the emergency medicine or the emergency room as um, an urgent care or as a doctor's visit. If you're doing that now, really, you're doing everybody a disservice. You're potentially exposing me to coronavirus and you're probably exposing yourself and then everybody you meet afterwards to coronavirus, right? It's not that I say that I don't like treating these people, but truthfully, the, at, at this time more than ever, the emergency room needs to be left for emergencies. It's really important that you only come if you absolutely need to. Now, if you feel like you need to, do it. If you're feeling short of breath, I, I know some people that are, don't want to come. They're like, we're afraid to get anywhere closer. And if you 
or sick or feeling short of breath, you have chest pain, I want to see you and I want to make sure you're safe. That's really important. Don't just don't hide yourself and um, get yourself sick or put yourself in an unsafe situation because you're trying to avoid the coronavirus. That's extra anxiety. That's that's something you you don't need to do. So um, please be careful about that. I'm going to go back to these questions on here. Um, Chris asks if you can get it again. So there's a there's a little bit of step to that. And let's talk about that. So data from SARS virus demonstrates that everybody that had the initial disease developed an immunity within 14 to 21 days and then had that immunity for up to two years, right? So also they, so that, that suggests that with this coronavirus, we would think that if you have this strain and you have an immunity to it, you are not gonna get the same one again. What you can get is you can get coronavirus and influenza at the same time. Be mindful of that. So you can have both, which we're finding it has been a little bit scary. Uh, we have found that there's another strain that they're worried about, which can come, right? So viruses, what they like to do is they like to mutate, they like to evolve. And so you can end up getting a new strain that can cause it. In fact, we're kind of expecting it, right? So the coronavirus has caused the common cold. People get the common cold every year. That's because you get a new strain, they evolve, they do it. There's some people who think that this might end up being like the flu, where we have a seasonality to it, right? Where it comes and goes every year as a new strain shows up and we have to deal with it. That's gonna be the new conversation about vaccines. How are they gonna work? What are they gonna target? One thing to keep in mind is that there, for the SARS virus, there was studies, there were studies, excuse me, that showed that uh, people about 10 years out started to lo lose that immunity. So it's not as though you're gonna be immune forever, but they think five to 10 years. So that's pretty positive. If you have and you have that immune uh, immunity to it, we think that you shouldn't be able to get it again. At least that's what the current data is demonstrating. Um, naproxen, Andrew asked with ibuprofen. I honestly don't know that specifically. Um, I would say the current recommendation is against all NSAIDs, which is ibuprofen, naproxen, ketorolac, uh, dextromethorphan, if I'm saying that right. And then the other ones, Igor, you can actually help me out. I know you know these things um, because you're smarter than I am. Um, all right, so where are we? I had another good one here. Um, oh, and just for those of you, and um, <laughs> Danielle, if you're getting anxious, don't. Again, I wanna reassure people and say that most of us are gonna get through this fine, right? 99% of people are gonna be asymptomatic. I'm not sorry, not asymptomatic, are gonna be fine. They're not gonna be critical, are gonna get through this. And on the other side and be like, oh, that was scary. That kind of stuff, that kind of sucked, but that was it. The people to worry about are the people that are over 85 and then the people that are over 60. If you have high blood pressure, diabetes, if you have asthma, pay more attention. The other group, and this has kind of been an interesting thing, which has been evolving when I'm getting questions. If you're a cancer patient, if you're a transplant patient, or if you're on immunomodulating or immunosuppressant drugs, those are the people we have to pay attention to. I don't know the specific recommendations. I have to look it up. What I had, I had a conversation um, with a friend of mine today about how to approach this. And I would kind of approach this person, if, if they're truly a transplant person on uh, medications that suppress their immune system, you consider putting them in a room, uh, cleaning that room thoroughly and only having minimal contact with them. The way we do it in the hospital, if somebody has um, a neutropenia or if they have a compromised immune system, we don't walk into the room unless we have full PPE. It's a face mask, uh, hat, full gown, gloves. And that's to prevent transmitting any of the infections we were exposed to to that person. Not necessarily recommending that to everybody that's obviously overkill, but it's something to consider. Those people are at high risk. So you need to be very mindful of exposing them to this virus because they could be at higher risk and they could get very severe disease. All right. Um, Samantha, that's a great question. So Samantha asks, um, I'm a veterinarian. How important do you think it is for us to decrease the use of PPE to save it for human use? I'm trying to get my hospital to stop elective procedures. Um, this is an opinion. I think that it's probably pretty important. You know, I think um, there's a reality that we might be having to make sacrifices and difficult, difficult choices in the next two weeks to a month as to what we choose and um, what risks we have. I'm hopeful that um, our higher ups 
our administration and CEOs are going to focus on uh, providing us with more personal productive equipment and focusing manufacturing on the items and the things that we need in order to do our jobs and in order to protect humans, but I can't guarantee that. I know that there already currently is a shortage in hospitals, and there are certain hospitals out there, and specifically in the Boston area, which are running out of masks. They just don't have them. So I think this is a really legitimate concern and something to consider. I think that's part of the reason why hospitals, um, both veterinarian and for people, have been decreasing their elective procedures for that reason. Um, so this is actually, so this is a, an interesting question. Megan asks, if you think you have Corona, well, if I have Corona, I'm gonna drink it. But if I think I have coronavirus, have flu or cold-like symptoms, what kind of doctor should we see and how should we treat ourselves? So, um, uh, so what I recommend to people is the same thing. So initially what I did is I recommended uh, people treat it like the flu. So if you come to the emergency department and you come to me and you have symptoms of the flu, it should really consist of what? Cough, sore throat, runny nose, fever. What I would tell you is, sorry, go home, more or less. So for people that are high risk, there is Tamiflu. But for everybody else, I recommend antipyretics, which at this point is Tylenol. If you can talk to a doctor, if you're getting GI symptoms, you can get Zofran. Zofran can help with some of the nausea. It does tend to help mitigate some of the other symptoms of um, overall feeling aches, pains, things like that. Um, and then plenty of water and rest. Some people talk about exercise, some people don't. Um, it's kind of mixed whether you should exercise. If you truly have a fever, I personally recommend that you take the day off, right? That's your body kind of mounting a reaction and response to try and fight off the disease, right? It's using the energy that your body has stored in order to try and fight and ramp up your temperature. So my recommendation as a physician would be to take it easy, let your body do its job, let it focus on, on that metabolism and focus on that immune system and don't give it anything else to do. That's my recommendation. Now, this gets into a fun one, which I get to talk about, which are some of those other cures and we talk about the nutraceuticals, right? So there's a lot of people out there talking about different treatments and things that you can do to try and treat coronavirus. And I think the vast majority of them are crap, right? So, sorry, I'm not against nutraceuticals or holistic medicine. I wanna put that out there right now. I think a lot of it can be good, but a lot of people are throwing things out there, um, trying to, you know, either make a buck or, you know, trying to be helpful, but just don't do it. So there's a couple of things out there. Uh, and for instance, my, uh, my uh, aunt Karen asked me about elderberry and if it's effective. So I did specifically look at this. So elderberry, elderberry, and I can't talk today as usual, elderberry is an antioxidant which helps promote the immune system by decreasing the amount of stress on it and activating neutrophils. For this virus in particular, I mean, I don't have any data completely theorizing here, I would say that it wouldn't necessarily be effective because it's not necessarily helping the immune system that specifically targets this disease process. The disease process, or I'm sorry, the immune response that um, targets the virus or targets bacteria is different than those that target viruses. You have a different response and a different uh, reaction to it. It's a completely different mechanism that's involved. So the mechanism that's involved in treating a bacterial infection is sort of helped by those antioxidants to sort of use those oxygen-free radicals that can sort of help. But this is mediated by your um, CD4 and CD8 uh, lymphocytes, which are more focused on producing antibodies to a particular uh, virus or contagion, and then targeting that and then blowing up the, your own cells that have that virus. So it's a little bit of a different process. I haven't found that it helps. People are talking about heat. I want to address this one just because I think it's hilarious. It's interesting because there's some logic to it, but it's not really going to help. So there has been some uh, evidence that, or some evidence that the virus doesn't do well at higher temperatures, right? So um, I'm messing up my hair here. So uh, people say that up to 133 degrees, the, temp the virus doesn't do well. So just heat myself up, go into a sauna. I've heard people using hair dryers into their nose. Um, so this isn't going to help you. Uh, the big thing is, as we had mentioned earlier in this, uh, the coronavirus likes to infect the bottom of your lungs. Your body does a pretty darn good job of keeping you at 98.6 degrees, right? Because if you've ever had a fever, you know how terrible it feels, right? So 
imagine going up three degrees, imagine going up, I don't know, 30 degrees, it's not compatible with life. You're not gonna do well. So the idea of doing it to yourself really just doesn't have a lot of ground in my opinion. Heck, maybe someone will find it, but I don't think it's really gonna make that much difference, unfortunately. All right, more questions, let's see. Should patients with Lyme disease be concerned? Um, so for those of you who don't know, Lyme disease is actually um, triggered as an autoimmune disease. It's initially thought to be secondary to uh, a bite from a tick, and then you get uh, proteins in the system, and then it's an uh, autoimmune disease that affects your entire body. Um, specifically, I can't speak to this. I know for certain patients that have Lyme disease, if they can be on immunosuppressants or immuno, any immunomodulating drugs, that can certainly ask, act as a risk factor, and that can decrease your body's immune system and then can be a concern. As far as Lyme disease itself, I'm gonna say I am not intimately familiar with that disease enough to tell you whether or not that would have a uh, specific risk for coronavirus. I don't have any data on that. I would say probably not. It more depend on what medications you might be taking. Thanks, Aaron. All right, so let's go to more. So we talked about well, seasonality for it. That was one of the big questions I had. Um, we talked about the effectiveness of surgical masks. We did, oh, pregnancy and kids. So let's talk about this. So um, I've had questions about, do I need to be concerned about pregnancy? I've even had people ask, uh, if I shouldn't get pregnant or if I should wait to get pregnant until after this is all gone? Good question, hard one to answer exactly. First and foremost, I have to say, we don't really know. Nobody has good data on this specifically for coronavirus. Can't say, I don't know if I can specifically do it, say it, but for the first and second trimester, there's really no evidence um, of how it's gonna affect you. There is some, uh, reassuring data that say, suggests that you will not pass it to your fetus. It does not appear to cross the placental barrier, so you don't have to worry about uh, getting the infection and then sending it to your unborn baby. Um, as far as you during pregnancy, the biggest risk actually comes later on. So when you're in third trimester, and if my mom's watching, I don't think she is, but man, I wish she was. Um, she can uh, try to help me out on this. But um, what happens is as the uh, uterus grows, it's gonna push up on your diaphragm, and that pushing up on your diaphragm actually decreases your lung expansion and how deep breaths you get. That can cause an increased amount of fluid in your lungs, and that can lead to uh, basic de de decreased um, respirations and also makes a nice little um, culture or medium for the virus to grow and, and hang out. So that can lead to a little bit higher risk of pneumonia and higher risk of respiratory infections in general. So that overall increase your risk on, in late pregnancy, uh, but overall not there. There is some reassuring data as far as uh, newborns. There's been one case that I've heard of so far of a newborn being infected with coronavirus. We do think that if you are infected with coronavirus, you have a delivery that that immunity that you are developing in your body would be passed along to your newborn and they would actually be uh, mostly immune or have significant immunity for up to six months until their own immune system would kick in. So that's reassuring as well. Um, as far as kids go, they've actually shown protection. Oh man, I think it's uh, ages four, uh, four and above. I have a pretty significant protection against the virus. I could be doing that wrong. I knew nine, heard about nine somewhere. Um, there is, some of my pediatrician friends have told me there might be an increased risk for patients uh, or kids less than one. I haven't seen any data to corroborate this, uh, but that, that's some of the information that I've gotten. Um, another question a lot of people have been asking is about pets and can I get it for my pets? So I looked, I looked at this a little bit um, and I looked up from um, the Oregon site, or Oregon Veterinarian Society and um, they are saying, at this point, we think no. Uh, so it's a little bit of a complicated answer. The coronaviruses, the COVIDs uh, in the past that caused common cold, there are versions that infect uh, mammals and pets. Obviously, um, from my discussion before, if you missed it, go back. Um, we do think that this crossed over from mammals, either um, uh, pangolins or bats. So mammals can get infected by coronavirus. At this point, this particular strain doesn't appear to affect pets very much. 
Um, there has been no uh, research that I know of that seems to uh, affect or uh, uh, look at how it affects um, the hair on pets and if it lingers on hair. I haven't seen one on, bird, on beads, or, oh my gosh, on beards. But um, at this point, we don't think that you can really get it from your dog. I think there's one case in China where they think it might have happened, but that data is spotty. We don't know about it. I wouldn't um, put a lot of emphasis on it at this time. There are people looking at it. That research is being done. So more information will come. Um, so again, as that information, as that data evolves, uh, we'll update that and try to look. Um, all right. So Megan's asking me again, what are all the ways we can get it? Can we really get it walking outside if someone coughed corona into the air and we walk through the, that air hours later? The government says we can still take walks outside. Should we ideally not leave our house at all? So in theory, based on the information that we have right now, the short answer is yes, kind of. So um, we do think that the virus can live in the aerosol. So that means... So you have to understand the, the nature of this study, right? So they basically took the virus, aerosols, sprayed it into the air in a controlled environment and measured how long it was there for. And when they measured it, they saw it there for up to three hours. Now it decreased steadily during that time. How infectious the air is gonna be hours later after someone sneezes into the air is something that we truly don't know and can't say specifically at this time. It's too early to tell. What I can say is, that is part of the reason we're reducing all the contact and the um, travel. I know here in Los Angeles, there's a travel ban. They're trying to restrict uh, all non-essential movement and travel throughout the city. That's why, because the belief is at worst, the most pessimistic uh, um, outlines or uh, data, most pessimistic data demonstrates that you can have aerosols, you can have aerosolized virus in the air for up to three hours, and then you can walk by and get it. So the safest thing to do is to stay in your house. Now, for most people, like I said, most people need to expect that they're probably going to get it at some point. Most people probably have some sort of uh, innate immunity to what's going on in the air. That's why they're recommending social distancing and staying away because it can be on you, it can be on your breath for a long time. So be mindful, limit the travel, limit going out. And that's why we're saying stay out of the emergency department. Just by being there and breathing on us and breathing the air out there, you can be infecting the other patients there and um, <laughs> the other patients there and you can be infecting me. And frankly, I care about me. I want to stay alive and I want to not have to deal with this. So that's that. All right, let's see what other questions people have. <laughs> Josh is a fellow ER doctor of mine and he's asking if COVID can exacerbate fibromyalgia. Um, <laughs> For those of you who don't know, I think we do have to take fibromyalgia seriously. It's something we kind of joke about. Only for you, Josh, if you come to me with fibromyalgia, I'll take you very seriously and I'll give you all the dilated you could ever ask for. Love you. All right. Um, Aaron, thank you. How long do we think that uh, social distancing would be necessary? Oh, too early to tell. Um, I think the, the current recommendations are doing for about a month. Uh, which is keeping people, because remember, what we're doing uh, in essence, um, what we're doing in essence is we're not decreasing the total number of people that are going to be infected. We're decreasing the time frame that's going to be, right? So we still anticipate a lot of people to get this. Uh, the more, the longer uh, projections for the shedding of the disease after you've had it can be up to 37 days. Again, um, a lot of the infographics we've been sharing and that we've had out there, um, I'm going to be putting them all at the bottom in the comments here. So uh, keep an eye out for that. That has a lot of that information. But yeah, there is information, there is data that suggests it can be, you can be shedding it for up to 37 days. So by staying inside, you're hopefully developing that immunity and slowing down how long and how quickly uh, we're spreading the disease. So I think with that model, we can actually expect it happening for quite some time. Um, I'm going to forget his name because I'm terrible with names. Uh, current head uh, epi epidemiologist that's uh, currently uh, advising the Trump administration is saying that you can expect significant changes for a long period of time. Um, it is not out of the realm of possibility to say that 
this could be existing, this could be part of our lives for about six months um, or maybe along that time frame. So yeah, um, I would say at least a month, uh, worst case scenario, a year, reasonable projections, uh, a couple months, maybe six months that we're dealing with this and people are recommending kind of staying away. Now, I think the quarantines that are being uh, imposed here in Los Angeles, I think are gonna go away in about a month. I think that people need to resume their daily lives. Otherwise, you know, what are we gonna do? Um, people need to live, people need to make money, people need to eat. So I think that that's gonna be there, but um, yeah. Dariana, you asked me uh, what expectorants are safe. Uh, can you elaborate on that? I'm not sure what you mean. I guess if you're talking about MDIs or inhalers, things like that. Um, <laughs> getting some funny questions out. You guys are way more entertaining than I am right now. You just follow the comments and you guys are gonna laugh. Maybe that'll be, be better. Um, Austin, you definitely need to avoid the purple stuff. We've had that conversation a lot. Um, let's see. Do you hear, Andrew asked if you hear Goliath in the background. I'm not home. Uh, Goliath is my mom's little Pomeranian who is now, what, 13, blind and deaf and likes to make a lot of noise. No, unfortunately, that's the neighbor's dog. All right, so let's get into some other more specific questions. I'm going back to my list that I have over here. Um, talk about how long to stay inside. What if I need food? What do I do? So different, different questions about... Um, um, how to survive and what to do if I'm quarantined. Um, have you tried reading a book yet? Weird, I know. Um, a lot of people now, a lot of places are moving towards uh, the delivery services. I know here in LA, they're making a killing, kind of moving to the delivery service. I think everybody knows that. Um, uh, make sure that you're catching up on your HBO, your Netflix. I know I'm uh, gonna be uh, dealing with that here soon. Um, trying to probably stay in. I have a couple patients so far that I suspect might have had the coronavirus. Right now, our testing is taking up to six days to come back. So I'm still waiting for those tests to come back. I am not quarantined yet. I am doing my best to limit uh, my exposure to everybody, um, basically staying home, not really doing much ordering in, um, but I don't know yet. So I haven't been symptomatic. Um, so I'm relatively optimistic that I don't have it, um, but it's um, I have another good question here. Uh, so this was one that actually came in from uh, my friend Kevin. So how many people are expected to die? I think this is a good one. I think one it's we can uh, to talk about. Um, right now the projections vary. Um, early CDC estimates that are about 160 million people to totally be infected. Um, death toll is mostly going to be in the elderly. But right now, projections are anywhere from 200,000 to 1.7 million. Remember, this is going to be over a span of approximately six to eight months. So it's going to happen over time. But directly from the coronavirus, that is kind of what we're expecting. Um, right now, I think the last I saw, man, I think we're at 10,000 confirmed cases and 100 and, or 202 deaths. Um, I am going to be updating that. Me and uh, um, my friend Kevin and I, Kevin is a emergency medicine physician practicing in Louisiana. He is, uh, he did a live stream two days ago. He and I are gonna be doing a joint one with updates tomorrow night, which is strictly gonna be sort of looking at the new data, the new information and case logs. We're gonna be doing that tomorrow. So same time, same bad time, uh, same bad channel tomorrow at eight o'clock. We're gonna be doing a joint one where we talk about this, do any updates, hopefully more information on, on Advil Motrin as that comes out, treatments, um, and then projections. So uh, looking at that, uh, stay tuned. Please check into that if you have any questions or if you missed anything, um, that's that. How safe is takeout? Um, uh, Chris is asking me this. So right now it's actually pretty safe. Most uh, restaurants are under orders to be treating takeout carefully. I know here in Los Angeles, they'll only drop it at your doorstep. They're using gloves. They're using sanitary measures. For the most part, people are taking it um, pretty seriously and being cautious about it. I think it's your safest option. I think it's probably safer than going to the grocery store. Um, not to say nobody can go to the grocery store. Again, people are gonna live their lives, but people need to do it. Oh, good, mom's here. Hi, mom. So uh, 
this brings up another question. She's talking about testing here in other countries. Um, so testing here has been a little bit of a, a, a conundrum, right? So um, we'll talk about the test and what to do about it. So test right now, as we have it, um, is a rapid uh, PCR test, which actually looks at viral proteins in your nasal mucosa, in your saliva, puts that through a PCR, looks at the proteins and tries to identify them. Initially, we had uh, reports that that was coming back in three to four days. Right now, because of the overwhelming uh, demand for that test, it's going as far as six days. So it's been pushed back quite a bit. Right now, the availability is pretty sparse. Uh, it depends uh, region by region and state by state. We've had different states with different availability in different places. The best thing I can do is say, uh, call up your local health department or hospital and see how many they have. Uh, as of yesterday, um, the Infectious Disease Society of America has actually put out guidelines for us as physicians for testing, which is four tiered. So those of you, if there are any physicians that are paying attention um, or watching this, or do watch this, those are the current recommendations. It's four tiers. Essentially, the first tier is those people that are critically ill and look like they have the disease, right? So those people are the first line for having it, and those are the people we're trying to save the testing for, because we need to know what they have, why they have it, and if they're in the ICU, if they're gonna infect other people. So we're saving those tests right now for those people that we feel are really ill. Second tier are the people that are sick, but, are uh, not sick enough to be in the ICU, but look like they could have it, right? So that's second tier. At the facility that I've been working at most recently, that was our current recommendation. If you came in and I felt you needed to be hospitalized and based on your clinical condition, you look like you had high risk of deterioration, which is essentially a judgment call here on physicians, then I would order a coronavirus test and test you for it. Then we get to tier three. So tier three are outpatients, so you're sick, you have a fever, you look like you have it, but you're good enough to go home. Right now, our recommendations and basically how we've been doing it, we will not test you. So we'll send you home and say that you have it. You can get an order from a doctor and there are other places that are trying to set up drive-by testing to try and get this set up so you can get tested. I would love that, that'd be great. Fourth year is everybody. Everybody has symptoms, that's the ideal. In places like South Korea, where they were able to institute uh, generalized testing for everybody and get everybody tested, they have found significant decrease in the harm of the disease and uh, increased rate of getting rid of the disease. Why we don't have it here is a good question. I know we're working on it. You can, I'm gonna say as apolitical as I can, stay away from why things are happening. I know some people are talking about frustrations with the CDC and our current uh, leadership, I will say, I'll get on my high horse a little bit and say, I think things could have been done a little bit better. I think things need to be done better. I think we can do it. I think offering testing to everybody in the United States should be something that we should be able to implement and get done. And I have other physicians I've seen in different uh, focus groups, Facebook groups uh, that agree with that. So hopefully that's getting done. I actually read an article uh, about three hours ago that's suggesting they are going to be developing a test that can get us the results within 45 minutes. So I'm hoping that that ends up being the case. I'm optimistic. I think it needs to be done. I think people need to push that. I think all of us need to promote that because I think it's very important to decreasing the lethality uh, and the effect that this disease ends up having on our country and the people. So I do promote that. Um, will contagious but asymptomatic persons test positive? Asked Andrew. The answer is yes. My understanding is at this point, if you are infectious, if you have the virus as it stands in your saliva, or actually goes up your nose as it stands now, it's the same as the flu. If the proteins that are specific to this virus exist on you or there, you should test positive. So you don't need to be symptomatic to test positive. In fact, I'm pretty sure that's how they found out that so many asymptomatic carriers existed in China was that they were testing so many people, checking them and found that, hey, you can be positive uh, spreading the virus and it's asymptomatic. Um, he also asks, once someone tests positive, how often should a person be tested while sick? If you test positive, there's no reason to retest you. Um, if you know you have coronavirus, then we just pro, uh, proceed with treating you and dealing with uh, the disease as it stands. At this point, that's if you're at home, uh, staying away from other people, 
getting lots of rest, getting lots of water, Tylenol for your fevers, and then medications to help with your symptoms so that you can rest, relax, and let your body do its work. Some of the things I recommend are things like and Flonase. They tend, do tend to help with some of that cough and congestion you feel. Zofran's the one thing that I can prescribe to people. It generally helps with uh, nausea, vomiting, and GI upset. Yeah, Karen says they won't test someone with no symptoms. You're right. Right now, we do not have the availability of tests to test everybody. We don't have it. I know at the hospital I was working at, I had 250 tests for everybody, and that's for a town of 2,000, 20,000 people, right? So I have to save those tests for the people that I think absolutely, totally need them, right? So at this point, we are rationing out the tests, trying to figure out who the best people to test are. We don't have great guidelines. That data is still being developed, and we're still figuring out the protocols that are required to, to tell us who should we, we should be testing, when and how. I want there to be testing for everybody. Trust me, I think it would be great. It's not out there now. <laughs> Lorraine asked, do you think bandanas or scarves are better? Great, right? If, for those of you who haven't seen it yet, there's a current CDC recommendation that says, if you run out of uh, N95 masks or PPE, just use bandanas or scarves. Uh, there's a great essay out there from another doc that says, this is essentially like the fictional uh, show Chernobyl, where people are just wearing stuff over there hoping for the best. Um, this is terrible. Uh, I think a lot of us out there think that this is kind of, uh, I don't wanna say criminal, but we'll say criminal uh, because we're, we don't, the providers out there who are trying to treat people who are known to be getting sick, getting critically ill, don't have enough of our supplies. So please, 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 you know, this is our, um, our plea to everybody. If you have the masks, if you are hoarding them, please don't do it. Uh, we need we need those masks. We need those for our healthcare providers. Walk to your nearest uh, hospital and hand them your masks because those are the people that need them, and those are the people that are high risk, highest risk. I think I shared a study now that forty percent of people um, that are getting sick or that are critically ill are going to end up being healthcare providers. It's significant. It's not something to be ignored. All right. Let's see. Everyone saying, say, save, pray for me. I appreciate that. I wish that for all of you as well. Um, Sean asks, have you heard of any supplements that rate reduce chances of getting virus or reduce complications? So actually there's one, um, this was given through me through the grapevine. Um, I'm gonna try and add the link at the bottom here. The only thing I heard, uh, there's a Dr. Tina, she's a naturopath. She looked at research from somewhere else um, that talked about licorice, the protein in licorice, uh, actually being able to um, prevent the binding of the coronavirus to the ACE2 inhibitor or ACE2 receptor to do that lock and key to try and prevent that, that specific protein. There's research that went on with the SARS virus that was looking at that as well. Um, this doesn't mean go you know, eat all the licorice, but that is a potential thought and treatment that people can look at. Um, there has been, look at things like elderberry, heat, things like that, other supplements. I do in general recommend things like vitamin D, vitamin C, getting zinc. Those are things that try to optimize your lymphocytes and your immune system and your overall system. It basically helps, oh, those are the building blocks that your body needs in order to build the cells and build the antibodies that are required uh, in order to fight off these infections. So I do think that those can be helpful during this time right? Like you see emergency and stuff like that for general immune system. I am a believer in those. I think that those things do tend to help. I think they give your body um, the ammunition it needs to fight off these infections, um, specifically how they target the virus and for this particular virus. Other than that thing I heard about licorice, and again, that's hearsay. I'm going to uh, look at that link, but that's um, the only thing I've heard so far. Um, so mom asks, Barbara asks, since lots of sick people are not hospitalized, how do we know when to quarantine ourselves as providers? So uh, there's, there's a little bit of controversy here. My understanding, so this is something I've dealt with pretty personally, um, being an ER provider and expecting to see coronavirus. So currently what they're recommending for healthcare providers is that if you are in the room with someone who tests positive for coronavirus and you're not wearing any PPE, um, they end up having, if you're around them, 
Um, then you go home for 14 days in quarantine. Um, right now, they're recommending that everyone wears a mask with a face shield. If you wear that, then your likelihood of being exposed from that person, even in their positive, is low enough that you can go back to work. If someone is critically ill and they test positive for coronavirus and you're around them treating them, um, or if they're intubating them, you're doing an invasive procedure, then we have to wear the N95 mask. If I don't wear an N95 mask and I intubate someone with coronavirus, I have to assume that I have it for, and then go quarantine for 14 days. So that's the kind of the answer. If you are next to somebody or you're treating somebody that has the virus, a test positive, um, then you have to assume you have it. And it's the same thing to do. They're keeping people home. Um, the problem is, like you said, if people are asymptomatic, so you won't know. There's a lot of times I've been treating, again, my friend Kevin, so my friend Kevin is on day uh, seven of his quarantine. He was initially treating a patient who was at the time that he was treating them was completely asymptomatic. They came in for something unrelated. They later tested positive for coronavirus and he's in quarantine and he gets out on Tuesday, which is why he has all the free time to do these live videos and why he and I are gonna do another one tomorrow. He's also doing a lot of TikToks and YouTube stuff. Um, so that's fun. So, I mean, I might be here in the same boat. You might, guys might be getting sick of me because if I'm quarantined for 14 days here in LA, you know that I'm gonna be finding some way to try to entertain myself. So there you go. Um, <laughs> um, let's see what else we have. Austin asks if I'm single. The answer is, right. So um, Lauren's asking me about, um, an opinion about uh, ibuprofen and, and coronavirus and worsening it. Um, so right now, the current recommendations are to avoid ibuprofen. So I'm going to update people. I assume I can't see it, but I'm assuming people are coming and going um, and uh, talking about the different things. So um, what we know about coronavirus right now is that um, it, it appears to have an affinity for the uh, ACE2 receptor in your body. ACE2 receptor is responsible um, for the complicated process of managing your uh, blood pressure. It exists on your uh, type 2 pneumocytes in your lungs. It exists on the endothelial cells or the vascular cells of your heart. It exists on your kidney and your liver. So uh, coronavirus attacks these cells or attacks these receptors. It goes on the receptors, attacks these cells, and blows them up, essentially. This is why uh, men with hypertension, uh, men in general, uh, people with diabetes, anybody has more of these receptors are more susceptible uh, to this virus and to more severe disease. Right now, um, through an unknown process, there's a, a French physician who looked at this and believes that um, through propagation of PGE, uh, it does tend to upregulate the ACE2 receptors in your lungs, which therefore theoretically would increase the likelihood of you getting a more severe disease should you catch coronavirus. This has not been studied. There's no real studies that look at it. It was just, I believe it was an expert opinion um, by people out of France. Please correct me if I'm wrong, um, but that's right now, since there is a theoretical harm and it does make biological sense, we are recommending that you avoid ibuprofen and use Tylenol instead for your fever or for any pain or, or muscle cramps that you're, happy, that you're having. So that's the current recommendation. Amber asks about, have I heard about hydroxychloroquine? Oh my gosh, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin being used for treatment. Okay, did address this earlier. Welcome, I'm glad more people are seeing it. So um, right now, they've initiated a clinical trial for hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. So we'll see. There is some optimistic data and um, evidence that we'll see. I'm really curious. I just saw it before doing this. I didn't get an opportunity to really delve into the science and the biochemistry of this. I'll be curious. I will uh, attempt to do that before my repeat live stream with Kevin tomorrow, try and look closer at this. Um, what I can say is that there is a known treatment for severe disease called chloroquine, which was related. So chloroquine is the harsher version of hydroxychloroquine that was used to treat malaria. Uh, we believe that this works by decreasing the immune response uh, that happens in response to uh, the infection with coronavirus, right? What happens is coronavirus infects you, you end up having the cytokine storm or the overreaction of your immune system that basically liquefies uh, the organs that are affected, which is bad. We don't like liquefaction, not good. And 
Chloroquine is thought to decrease that effect by decreasing that specific immune reaction. So there is some optimism that hydroxychloroquine can help. Now, right now, that's only found to be helpful in critically ill patients, right? If you have the, the syndrome called uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome or, or, or ARDS, and that's a specific thing that we find that we're treating in crit critically ill patients. So is that necessarily going to be something that we see is going to be helpful for someone who has a mild infection with coronavirus? Probably not. I don't, I'm not super optimistic that that's going to make a difference. It might, what we're really looking at is whether or not it's going to save those people who are critically ill or on a ventilator and dying, if it'll prevent them from dying or even get them um, well more quickly so that we can use those ventilators. We have that stuff um, for other patients and for other people. Well, welcome, Andrew. I hope you guys are, are well and uh, staying safe out there. Chris, yes. So um, I have to look at it specifically. I think that people who are more critically ill and are really sick can shed it for up to 37 days. Um, most people, like I said, are going to have, are going to develop an immunity or stop. So the longest you can shed and still spread the virus is up to 37 days on the most uh, pessimistic and certain studies. Um, most people so understand the way immune system works, right? So you get the disease, and for most people, you're going to develop antibodies to that virus, that specific disease, within eight to 10 days, which means the body identifies it, creates specific antibodies that are designed to target the virus before it even gets in the cells and blow it up and stop it. So most people are going to basically be destroying that virus, shutting it down, not having anything within uh, eight to 10 days is what we think which is why the 14-day quarantine is in place, because theoretically, that should get rid of it. Um, uh, again, more of the pessimistic views are saying that it can be up to 37 days. Um, I'm not sure exactly what it is. I think that that's for people that are still sick, that aren't pro um, mounting the proper immune reaction and are still having issues and are still sick, coughing, and potentially in the ICU. So. We're starting to run out of questions here. Um, I hope this has been helpful for people. I'm gonna look through and see what other things, if I've missed anything, um, any other ideas. Uh, if you asked the question a while ago, please repost it uh, because I can't see it. I've got a bunch of them here. I have to go through. Uh, a lot of them are people being hilarious and my friends, which I love you. I hope that's great. I'm glad I have this much support my family. The people I care about, I want to keep safe. So that's the important thing. Uh, um, freaking out, am I going to be okay? All right, so the last thing I'll say, I don't really have any more questions. I think we've kind of talked about most of the stuff. If anybody thinks of anything, let me know. We've been going at it for an hour and a half, so that's a good amount of time. Um, big thing out there is to stay calm, be smart, be safe. Remember, we're doing this quarantine as, a, as an approach, uh, as an endeavor to try and protect our healthcare system. It's true that the vast majority of people, you and me, are going to be just fine, right? We're going to get it, we're going to feel sick for a little bit, and then it's going to be over. We're not going to have a major problem. Problem is not us. we got to think about the other people here in our society and the people uh, are elderly and our healthcare system, right? You and I are gonna be fine, but if we spread it to our, our elderly, if it gets into the nursing homes, um, people over the age of 80, 85 have a 15% mortality rate. If 15% of all of our nursing home patients come to the emergency department, come to our ICUs tomorrow, in the next week, we simply will not have enough our resources. Already we have uh, ICUs and people that are um, jerry rigging our ventilators so that we can use them for multiple people. There's rural hospitals that are turning one ventilator into four just so we have enough resources to take care of people. So remember, this quarantine, all the things the social distancing you're doing is not necessary to protect you or I. You're going to be fine. Your kids are going to be fine. Everyone's going to be okay. We're going to make it through this, right? You might end up knowing someone who's severely ill. You might end up knowing someone who's critically ill but most of us are gonna be okay. You're doing this to protect our healthcare system, you're doing this to protect your neighbor, and you're doing this to protect your friend, your brother's grandparents, things like that. So keep that in mind. Check one more time for a question. I hope everybody is safe. Um, 
Oh, sorry. I have to update. Mom says Goliath is 15, not 13. He's still deaf and blind. How he's surviving? I don't know. Maybe look at him for uh, for um, ideas on how to live forever. Because again, he's doing it. Um, Ethan Terry is jumping in late. Says, says uh, talk about sanitizing masks. How useful would that actually be? Um, I don't think that's helpful. I did touch on this. Sorry for the people who saw it already. Um, what's up, Baba? Um, <laughs> um, I don't know that sanitizing masks are going to help. So the only masks that are actually proven to prevent the actual infection with um, coronavirus, if you're up close and personal, are the N95s. The N95 masks are the big ones you're seeing that cover you like this, the big white ones that totally cover. That's because of the size of the virus. It's able to get in through the other one. So if you're wearing the other masks, they don't seem to actually help. Um, right now, the recommendation is you can use those for up to six days before they're ineffective. Sanitizing these, oh man, I don't know. So uh, this has been a thing. People are gonna be starting to try and figure out alternate ways um, to try and uh, figure out how to protect themselves. There's not a, good, a lot of good recommendations here. I think even nothing else, you try and sanitize and do it, but it's not great help. They do say that level three surgical masks can help people for general uh, general protection, but this right now are being saved for healthcare providers um, and finding for people that are uh, interacting with people that are sick. Uh, it's still not great. It's better than nothing, but it's not great. So. All right, starting to wrap up here. Um, if anybody else is uh, coming in and has any other questions, um, I am gonna be posting this on YouTube for people to find. So please um, like, share this. If you see it on YouTube, please share it. Um, I will be answering any questions that people have. Please personal message me as information comes available. I will be putting it out there and doing my best to try and uh, make people aware. Tomorrow, I will be with my other friend, Kevin. He's an ER physician practicing outside of Louisiana. Um, sorry, in Louisiana, outside of New Orleans. We will be doing an update tomorrow based on both of our information. Please tune in there. After this is done and once I post this, I'm gonna be putting a lot of links and infographics and uh, pictures down in the comments so people can get information. Grab those, share them, send them to your friends. There's a lot of good ones here for healthcare providers and for ICU docs, which I found really helpful. Please utilize them, utilize all the resources. This is about information and trying to protect as many people as possible. So I hope you enjoyed. If you're still with me, I love you. I hope uh, everybody's staying safe out there. Goodbye and uh, yeah, protect yourselves.